Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me today. Um, uh, it's a pleasure for me to take you on the journey uh, that we did with Accelera over the last uh, one and a half to two years, although I'll be focusing mostly on the, f on the first year. And I think, uh, yeah, I'm not going to sell you any IP today. Um, it's really kind of a user journey. Uh, we are a user of Risk Five so far, um, an active one, um, but I think that could be helpful, or I hope it will be helpful uh, for everybody or every individual at every company that is in a similar position as we have been uh, two years ago. I myself, I'm Florian. Um, I've been working with Risk Five for quite uh, a while, um, almost over eight years. And um, I've started um, my PhD in 2015 um, and have been working with uh, Risk Five for the, the sake of the PhD and afterwards. Um, and with that, I've mostly working on open source uh, hardware so far. Um, I'm the original author of CVS6, um, but I've also been authoring other things uh, like Snitch and I've been offering Pulpino. As I said, I did the PhD, uh, finished that 2021, um, and I'm also a proud director of uh, the Open Hardware Group since 2020, uh, which took over CVS6, um, and I'm managing that as, uh, partially as well, and a Risk Five ambassador since 2021, uh, so my blood speaks Risk Five. Um, I'm also a founding member of Accelera, um, and the journey started in November 2021, and uh, with all the kind of Risk Five DNA in my blood, I've been responsible for the CPU subsystem inside uh, the Accelera product. So about Accelera, to make you understand where we are coming from, um, or what, where we have been uh, when we have been founded in July 2021, uh, we have been founded by a very ambitious team of a few 15-ish uh, individuals from IBM, iMac, ETH, uh, Google and Qualcomm. And uh, for the, the vision that we create uh, a fairer, uh, faster and cheaper alternative for edge AI um, applications. Our focus is on computer vision solely, um, and we use that, uh, for, we accelerate that with our proprietary uh, digital in-memory computer array. So this is really at the heart of the system. In 2021, I just said this, we were roughly 15 people, so really a very small, um, eager and ambitious team. Um, and we already were quite in a good spot then. Um, we had uh, taped out our digital in-memory uh, computer array, so the heart of our system, um, in, as a test chip, and it worked. Um, but we had roughly had a runway of 12 months to make this test chip into a real product uh, surrounding hardware, and there's, there's much more to it than just the in-memory computer array, as you will see. So within this runway, um, I want to tell you um, uh, we have a couple of challenges as well. We are very proud that we are a European company. Um, we, are, we call ourselves a European company, but that also means that we have quite a team spread. So we are spread uh, main headquarters in the Netherlands, uh, but we have uh, bigger uh, subsidiaries in Switzerland, Belgium, and a lot of remote people. And it was clear that with 15 people, you couldn't really achieve what we wanted to achieve uh, to really make a product in 12 months. So it was clear that we needed to onboard new members. Why do I tell you this? It was really, really essential to hit the ground running. So we couldn't, uh, we couldn't really have any time wasted on exploration or anything, but we needed to execute. So what were, did we set out to actually build? What is this product? Let me uh, build it from the ground up. So at the heart, as I mentioned already a couple of times, is this uh, digital in-memory computer array. It's uh, a beefy SRAM array uh, with uh, embedded computational cells. Uh, it can store large sets of weights, multiple weight sets, uh, and then it can execute uh, matrix vector multiplication on it. Weights of the network are being stored in there, and then input and output data is being streamed through it. That alone, unfortunately, doesn't uh, capture all the use cases um, that uh, we want to encounter, but uh, there's a couple of extra computational cells needed. There's this auxiliary engine uh, that is doing uh, odd layers pooling, um, depth wise convolutions, and then there is a vector engine as well that is doing element-wise vector operations. This is not a RISC-V vector engine, but this is a proprietary risk, uh, vector engine, uh, the vector vector. And then uh, to top it off, there is uh, quite a, a substantial amount of L1 memory uh, attached to it. Uh, this is to use uh, to store input and output data and is uh, explicitly managed uh, using DMA uh, transfers um, to and from the scratch with memory from higher level or um, DDR. Then this core alone is the data path, um, but the data path is being controlled um, by, uh, oops, 
why we are here, uh, a RISC-V core, um, a dedicated RISC-V core for this data path engine. And why we are doing this is that we want to keep it flexible. We don't want to bake too much into hardware. We want to be adaptable for new networks that are emerging um, and new use cases. And it really already paid off a lot um, to have this RISC-V core being in charge, setting up the data path um, and not to bake too much into hardware. Flexibility is the key. Then we take one of those units, so this is an AI core, and this is the unit of, of repetition, and we repeat it four times to make up our METIS architecture. And METIS is the architecture um, that we've uh, been taping out. Uh, this one also contains um, LPDDR controller um, for model weights, uh, input data, output data, PCI Express to communicate with the host system, um, because we are attached on a PCI Express to M.2 card to the host system, as you will be uh, seeing. And then there's a really a substantial amount of 32 uh, megabyte L2 memory. And then um, there is a, a fifth RISC-V core uh, in the system that is doing SOC management, uh, booting, um, workflow dispatching to the individual RISC-V cores, um, and uh, that then has the need for running an operating system. And as I already mentioned, is that with the very short runway, it was we didn't have the time and we didn't have the team to really develop our own RISC-V solution, um, but we found a very suitable partner uh, within Endes. And so we, uh, the, the original idea was to have uh, maybe two cores, um, uh, two different types of cores, for the AI core and for the system controller, but eventually we just went uh, to use the same RISC-V core for all the different units, and uh, we are actually very happy with uh, the way it works out, and the AX25 is an application class uh, single issue in order core, but it's uh, very suitable and very um, good for the needs uh, that, we, uh, that we had. And finally, there is a sixth uh, RISC-V core hiding in the system. Uh, it's inside the root of trust. Uh, it, the root of trust, uh, the reason why we are including it is this is very important for our uh, customers uh, to protect their models. This is their prime assets. And so it is very important to establish uh, a secure boot scheme and to use encryption uh, to actually encrypt and store the models encrypted. And this one also uses a RISC-V core, although that is obviously not as visible. So on this journey, um, I've noted down a couple of pros and cons um, uh, about RISC-V, and uh, let me start with the, the really positive start, uh, stuff, the market. Uh, the market of RISC-V is great. I mean, you, you see it here now. Um, there's plenty of opportunity. There is uh, a lot of um, IP vendors, especially in the low to mid end uh, right now. There is a lot of choice. Um, and choice is really good because it creates a healthy ecosystem. Um, this is especially important for us as a startup. We don't want to be bullied into a, a, in a situation, but we want to have the choice of, um, uh, that enables us a, a good and a competitive product. Uh, what also was really um, cool, um, I was really afraid of the IP negotiations, um, but that really worked flawlessly. Um, we, I think it was like three weeks um, from initial contact to RTL in hand, so that it really fits very well into the kind of accelerated timeline that we were aiming for. And finally, what I also saw uh, is really cool about RISC-V is that it offers you, all the IP provider offer you complete systems, end-to-end -end solutions, not just uh, here's the core and go do something with it, um, but it comes with interrupt controllers, debuggers, and so on. And in my opinion, this is a significant advantage to our other uh, ISAs and core providers. So an opportunity we saw as well is the, the software stack, which uh, turns out is really the expensive part of everything. It's like we are building software and we don't want to change uh, software from generation to generation, but that kind of contradicts my hardware or a system architect heart because I, we want to improve uh, from generation to generation. So it's really cool to rely on um, an ISA um, uh, as a contractual, um, uh, contractual agreement between software and hardware. Um, and so we have the freedom of rechoosing. Rechoosing means um, rechoosing IP provider, rechoosing own implementation in the future, uh, or rechoosing um, making individual contributions um, to uh, extension interfaces and so on. And this means practically no vendor lock-in, which again is a really cool thing because you don't want to be vendor locked in uh, for generations to come. And again, this creates a healthy ecosystem keeps the door open for future uh, developments. Uh, this makes, is personally as a RISC-V guy, this is uh, what makes uh, me excited. Um, and yeah, uh, it creates a healthy ecosystem. Beating on the software stack, uh, we found it was very suitable um, for what we, we had in mind. 
we were uh, we were exp explicitly pleased with um, the um, amount of uh, reference models or availability of of emulators. Um, uh, in particular, what we did is we used Spike and QEMO for a full system emulation. So we have the host emulated, we have the uh, device emulated, and we could do that before we even had any IP contract signed. Um, this gives us a tremendous uh, advantage, especially with these short timelines. You need to start overlapping your developments. You cannot, uh, you cannot uh, do it waterfall style. Um, and with this reference model or with the system up and running, um, we could really um, overlap then. And thanks to this permissive license, you can just go, uh, go around, download Spike, hack around it, and you can run it in your CI, CI and uh, this really gives kind of a, a great um, a development environment. Uh, as I said, we had the software bring up uh, already going on before even an FPGA was ready or before the emulation uh, was ready of the, of the hardware. And then uh, something I definitely cannot really leave on the table given my background in open source hardware. I think this is kind of really the game changer for RISC-V itself. Um, all the hardware that is available, I mean, you can just go on the course list. There's tons of open source CPUs and the cool thing is there's also really a lot of high quality open source CPUs and thanks to the work of Open Hardware Group, um, things like CV32 is production ready um, and things like uh, CVS6 and Application Class Core, Rocket Boom, uh, those are all great examples of um, still cool open source um, cores. They are maturing and uh, they are becoming production ready. And why do I tell you this? Um, because it, for us, an R&D team, uh, it really enables us of prototyping. We don't need to engage in any license negotiations. It's a hurdle for us. Uh, we can just prototype, and then if the, the software that we are, uh, that we are developing on it, uh, that's, that's just compatible. So we can go with an IP vendor and we can swap it out underneath, um, but we can keep innovating uh, without engaging in uh, license, uh, boring license negotiations. And uh, lastly, the learning curve uh, is really cool. Um, we have a very talented software team, obviously, um, but the software team and the firmware team was really up to speed very fast. Um, I, I didn't expect it to be that fast, and I attribute it to um, two things. Um, I think the ISA is very well designed, it's simple, it's easy to understand. Then I did a very good uh, introduction to RISC-V, obviously, uh, to the software team. Um, and finally, uh, there is a a plethora of good and understandable low-level software that you can take, learn from, uh, looking at open SPI, but it's all very well written. So in general, the journey of getting up to speed was extremely smooth uh, from a software perspective. So what are the challenges that we faced? I think uh, rate of adoption, so we're developing stuff, it's really great and it's cool to see where, where things are going. Um, and this is really nice to see. Uh, P vendors are still catching up and this is a fair point. Uh, hardware is uh, developing slower and that's absolutely okay. I think where um, things start to be a bit um, tricky is when I, there is a need uh, that IP vendors start to solve in their um, own way. Um, particularly, I think the, the two pain points I would mention here is cache management operations and uh, ECC, so um, cache protection. Um, there was obviously a need and it, uh, it has been solved in a very specific way um, uh, without uh, a RISC-V solution, so to speak. Um, and uh, yeah, there are other, solution, uh, other vendor extensions as well, but uh, I think those are really kind of needed and that, prevents, that essentially provides you kind of a vendor lock-in because the firmware team is writing low-level software while I mean Linux can adapt to the different CPU types and so on by detecting the hardware. Um, our firmware does not do that. We are not writing our firmware to run on all CPUs. So this pr essentially uh, provides us with a slight vendor lock-in between generations. And this can be potentially a risk uh, to the very aggressive timelines that we are driving. Interoperability is also a um, bit of a concern from uh, my opinion. Uh, the uh, the RISC-V is definitely an ISA spec, so it, uh, that is very well defined. Um, semantics is very well defined, um, but then in reality, when you plug together different RISC-V cores, you start to run into uh, a couple of challenges. Uh, one thing that we found, for example, is the atomic handling. Um, I've seen at least three different ways of handling atomics. You can either do it via the cache coherency protocol, uh, you can do it via a proprietary AXI transactions in AXI5, for example, or you can do it in um, uh, via uh, load reserve store conditional um, ways. And while this is great and works for if each CPU agrees to this term, like bringing together different CPUs in the system, um, this likely does not scale. 
Uh, the same is for PMAs, for example, they are defined, um, but they are not as clearly defined in, okay, this is the PMAs that you should implement, and this kind of leads, leads to different understandings uh, uh, per implementation. Maybe the platform specification can come to the rescue here. Um, maybe, uh, although I believe it could be out, uh, outside the, the realms of the platform specification, maybe something like a reference platform, an integrator's guide, a best practice, could at least point out the caveats uh, and uh, just make the people integrating it aware. Devil is definitely in the detail, um, um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it worked out quite well for us. And then finally, something that uh, I struggle a bit with, it's, there's a lot of different uh, tracks developing uh, and there's a lot of cool development, but it's really difficult even like for me, that's actually, I mean, it's the main job to kind of keep up with it, to keep up with everything. Uh, you cannot possibly subscribe to all the mailing lists that are going on, there's the many different conversations. Um, so I think uh, that in that sense, uh, it, could be, it could be helping if we have something like a, a dedicated tech newsletter with where task groups report something, uh, like what, what's going on, um, or like an overview or status page of the different ratification timelines. And if that exists, it might very well exist, um, then I think we need kind of an entry page uh, to point people towards that. Um, yeah, and again, I think the CMOS, this is the <laughs> my favorite topic to beat on, uh, is, is something for example, I also see it lives like in a different space, although it's a really important, but I haven't seen it in coming into the main ISA document. So th th these are the couple of things uh, that make it a bit more challenging uh, to integrate. And then there's this bonus section. I really like the ecosystem. Uh, this is w what happens if you, you know, like let creative people work on the ecosystem. You get this nice instruction set and in, uh, decoder um, and the, the ISA string demangler, which is getting more important and more important, the more complex the strings are getting. Uh, so this is really cool stuff. So did we succeed in our journey? Yes, we did. Um, I brought actually also um, a PCI Express card today here. Um, we taped out uh, our Metis chip in 12 months. Um, you can see it sitting on the dev board here. And we actually, uh, it was a very smooth concept. We had the first RISC-V core booting within hours after the chip back, so it was really a great success. And now we are continuously deploying it into larger system. So we are uh, deploying it into M.2 cards um, uh, and in boxes like the Vision Gateway and PCI Express cards passively and actively cooled uh, into the Vision servers and into the Vision appliance, um, uh, a couple of uh, PCI Express cards. If you want to check out those boxes as well, please visit that as the booth. Um, and I'll uh, gladly give you a rundown on it. And then, where is Accelerator today? Uh, now we are over 130 people, although I think this number might be outdated already again. Uh, uh, we are spread really now completely over Europe. I think there are a few countries that we didn't touch so far. Um, the main headquarters remained, but we got Bristol um, attached. We have offices in Italy, Greece, uh, and so on. Uh, we've raised quite a substantial amount of money. Um, and uh, as we just showed, uh, we successfully uh, taped out Metis and we have a demo at our booth as well, so the thing is running. The key takeaway message here from my end is like RISC-V is really ready for prime time. We had no big deals uh, integrating it and it was quite a, a pleasant journey. So that uh, leaves me, uh, brings me to the end. Uh, Please pass by our demo booth uh, to learn more about the technology. Um, there's quite a substantial team here today as well. So please uh, talk to Evangelos, our CTO, Alex, software engineers here, George is our security architect, Merlin and me. Uh, catch us, I think we all have the Accelera uh, polo on. And um, for the next, uh, for the future, what's up to come, uh, there's gonna be a continued focus on uh, computer vision applications. This is really important. Um, but we are doubling down and we are expanding our risk five uh, footprint. So if you're interested to work in that space, I'll uh, suggest to reach out, um, get to, to our career space uh, page and uh, come join us. Thank you.